And I'd like to introduce Patty Anthony. She is the neuro-oncology nurse for Dr. Landolfi. Here's Patty. <laughs> the um, brain tumor maze, uh, insurance, disability, and more. Um, by no means am I an expert at, at, at insurance or disability, but I have become an expert at trying to triage problems and, and, and the maze to help you get the care that you need. Um, as we turn on the newspapers and we look at um, our new candidates, both Republican and Democrat, we find that the health reform um, is really an undecided area and no one really can um, say where we're, where we're going to go in the future with, uh, with health care. Um, the health reform that they're, they're uh, you know, that we're looking at now and what they're, they're hoping for the future, that it will provide more security and stability to those who have health insurance, it will give insurance to those who don't have health insurance, and it will lower the cost of the health care. The uh, National Institute of, of Health defines a cancer survivor as and someone from diagnosis through the end of life. So you survivors are the picture of um, the poster child for health care. You are the people that need to benefit from whatever plan that is going to come forward in the future. We, I, I kind of plagiarized from the, the health reform plan on I, you know, the website. Um, the health plan that is set forward will need to lower costs. But at what benefit, if our managed care are lowering their costs and premiums to give you care, you know, there's got to be a cut somewhere. And you know, what we're finding is it's more challenging. Over the last six months, I've put more people on patient assistance programs because their insurance are cutting corners to be less expensive, and we're finding they're not covering the care that you need. And as that survivor, yes, you acquire care during the immediate treatment, but that treatment can not, it only, only might be for a snippet of care in the beginning, but then it's ongoing care. It's those MRIs, it's the physical therapy, it's home care, it's getting assistance, it's transportation costs. So there's so much more to the cost of health care than sometimes that we're, we're being benefited for. So they're hoping to create um, better care. The Affordable Care Act has so far made changes where 50% of discount for name brand drugs in the Medicare donut hole. But if you're getting Timidar and you're already in that donut hole, that 50% can be $2,500. So it's expensive. Um, it's expanding coverage for young adults. There's going to be tax credits. This already has been put into place. And pre-existing conditions are not going to be a limiting factor for insurance plans. But let's look at the brain tumor reality. So I have a 32-year-old patient, I should say we, have a 32-year-old patient who is a 14-year brain tumor survivor with a hemorrhagioparasitoma. Tarceva and many other drugs are not FDA approved for her care. But her insurance approved it, and she got it for two months, and her tumor was gone at the two-month period. So we did not see a recurrence. She was doing well on it. In that time frame, she got a new insurance plan. The insurance plan denied it and denied it twice through an appeal. So we could not give her the drug. So what do you do in this type of incident? So we had to you know, try to fight for it. We went through the insurance company. We went through patient assistance programs. And we really could not get her the drug that she needed. So I have a 10-year survivor of an AA with a history of seizures. But otherwise, living life to the fullest, hasn't had a seizure. She's controlled on name brand seizure medication for several years. The insurance now only covers generic. In the past, we used to write a brain, na brain name only necessary. It doesn't work that way anymore. So we had to let her go to the generic. We did it over a period of time. So we tried to take the medication brand name that she had, wean her off of it, and put the generic. She still had seizures right after she went on to the generic medication. We tried, to, you know, we tried to appeal it. The appeal didn't go through. We upped the dose of the generic. The appeal didn't go through. They covered instead two generic drugs for her and put her on a second medication instead of actually 
authorizing the brand name, which we know worked for her. And I was just talking to someone else that's, that's here um, who I thought I was mimicking her story, but she had a very similar situation and had been on the drugs and they converted her to the generic and they, ne they would never go back to the brand and she had to stay on the generic and up the doses on the generic. We have a 65-year-old woman with breast cancer and a metastatic tumor to the brain. She's doing well, no symptoms, but as you know, we like to follow brain tumors closely. So she came in she, for her three-month follow-up visit, MRI of the brain with and without contrast, we'll see you in two months. The insurance did not, um, it was a managed Medicare, and they would not um, authorize it up front. It had to go into medical re review. Once it went into medical review, uh, they denied it, and they denied it, so we had to get Dr. Landolfi on the phone or a physician on the phone to do a peer-to-peer -peer review. Because she had no symptoms at the last visit, they were saying that she was doing okay and that she didn't need the scan. They actually only then allowed for her to get the contrast portion of the scan and not the other portion of the scan, which we still use the non-contrast and contrast scans to look at the overall tumor and picture. My copay is what, and I know a lot of you can relate to this. The um, Timidar is authorized on a body surface area. So we take your height and your weight and we come up with your dose. So it's very hard to juggle the doses of Timidar. So the Timidar is authorized, but it might only cover 50% of what your dose is. So if it could be $2,500 for, for 42 days, we've had people that have had $5,000 copays for 42 days because that's the initial cycle. And then monthly cycles are usually a little bit less, but sometimes can still be in the $1,000. But since we have to base it on your body surface area, that you, and Timidar comes in 140s, 180s, um, 100s, 5s, and 10s. So you might have to get three drugs. So your insurance company will pay a copay, but you have to pay it on each dose that you get. So you're paying on 100s, on 140s, and on 5s. So I've had patients in two rooms, same insurance company, one's paying $350 a month for their cycle, the other's paying $35. So it really depends on the, the uh, insurance plan. So one thing we do know that Prescription covers is very important, and getting, having a better insurance with better prescription covers is going to get you less copay. If you can't afford insurance, what do you do? And we're, we're now in a, a situation, as I said, in six months, I put more people on patient assistance programs. All of a sudden, I'm coming into a loophole, and the Timidar uh, Merrick knows me by name when their ACT program. We now they're referring out. So before I used to get people no problem, the applications go through, they're paying for the coverage. Now they're, it seems to be that they're doing more investigation, they're looking into insurance, they're looking into the co pays, and they are referring people out. Is that test covered? That's a question. So we, you come into our office, you sit down, and you're, you say, okay, this tumor, it's bigger. As many of you sat in front of our office or another doctor's office, it's immediately after, um, you know, after you have your radiation chemotherapy, it might look like the tumor's a little bigger. We might wait a month to have another scan and see you back in the office. Or sometimes it might look a little different. It might look like we're looking at progression instead of it being changes from radiation or necrosis. So we want to do some testing. The PET scan is a test that looks at the uptake of the tumor, so it can be a hot or cold scan, so we want to see if it's active tumor or a cold scan and not, not tumor. The problem is Medicare defines a lot of the insurance companies. So Medicare will pay for one, cat scan, one PET scan. So they'll pay for the first one, but after that, if we're still watching, it comes back cold, and then the next scan it's bigger, we might want to do another PET scan. It's not going to pay for that. So what do we do? So NOPR, which I think is in a very important for people to know, it was developed in the response because, you know, it, it was the um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid weren't covering it, so they started looking at the cost of it. So NOPR is actually a registry that we have to fill out paperwork and get you registered. Not every center is registered where you're going for your PET scan, so you have to ask them if they participate with NOPR. And they can help... Um, 
get you covered for the scan. So they'll pay for the scan. It's a study. And then what they do is look at the information that we, re we receive from the PET scan, and we have to fill out a post scan. Did it help us? How did it help us? Did it change therapies for you? So they're really evaluating why we're using PET scans. Spectros spectroscopy, and I think I heard um, one of the doctors speak about spectroscopy earlier. It's not always covered. Again, we're looking at progression versus necrosis. It can help us. Spectroscopy looks at the enzymes in the tumor, so it can help us determine between stroke and tumor. Insurance, Medicare think, uh, considers it investigational. So your insurance companies a lot of times, again, go back to Medicare and look at what they're paying for, and they will not consider it to be treated. So that's a $1,000 um, scan that you might be charged for because the MRI company that you're going to may have you sign a waiver when you're signing papers, but they're telling you that they're signing, they're not really telling and explaining to you what you're signing, and you might be signing a waiver that this is not a covered under your insurance, and you might get billed for that $1,000 then. And people do use spectroscopies quite often. But we tell patients up front that your insurance might not cover it. We can do a PET scan. Um, but again, it depends on where you're at with your insurance and trying to get it authorized. And if it goes into medical review, it might take a, sometimes up to seven days, 14 days to get it uh, authorized. And the timing of MRI scans, this is another problem. So you come in, it looks like progression, or it looks like that something might be going on with the tumor. We might think it's um, necrotic change, and we want to do an MRI scan. If it's not at least 30 days from your last scan, and you don't have an authorization for it, it might not get paid for. So we had a patient recently that we went to authorize it, and she was three days shy of it being the time frame where she can have an MRI. And it was even longer than a month because we weren't seeing her on monthly uh, cycles. And they didn't pay for it. They wouldn't pay for it, so we had to reschedule her exam and reschedule her MRI. So basically what you want to do is really get to know your insurance plan. You want to know what requires pre-certification. And unfortunately, you're dealing with everything else that's going on with a brain tumor and the ups and downs, who's working, who's not working, who's taking care of the kids, I can't drive it. And then you have to deal with all this, your, your insurance plan, what's covered, what's not covered. And you have to have somebody savvy enough to get onto the phone and start talking to the people on the other end who are reading off a checklist of who, who can have scans and who can't have scans. So you want to know what requires pre-certification. Do my MRIs uh, require certification? Do my physical therapy? Do my medications? I mean, anything that you're getting done, you want to know if it's, it requires pre-certification. Because if it's not pre-certified, you might be held for that bill. Are you required to go to certain facilities? Recently, they've changed. Um, a lot of insurance companies aren't covering. So if you go to a hospital facility, there's an extra charge a hospital facility charges. Uh, insurance companies aren't paying for this anymore. So you might have, your copay might be going up to like a $200 copay instead of a $50 copay because they're not covering the cost of this extra charge. So you might have to go to a freestanding facility instead of the hospital facility that you've been going to to cover that so that you're not putting that extra money out of pocket. So make sure that the facility that you've been going to is a facility that is accepted with your insurance. Um, and again, making sure that your testing is covered. And this includes lab work. Lab work is not always covered at the hospital, so it's very convenient, and especially for you who is the brain tumor patient going back and forth, coming to radiation every day, to just go to the hospital lab. Most insurance plans will not allow for you to go to testing at that facility. You need to either go to LabCorp or to Quest or whoever your insurance designates you to go for for that lab work. And just talking about lab work, um, we sometimes write for stat lab work because the patient didn't have it done. They're due to start their chemotherapy. Um, they might be on a clinical trial, and part of it we need to get done, um, and, and insurance will pay for reasonable uh, lab work. Uh, we write for STAT. We just had a patient come back and the insurance isn't covering anymore. It was done at a facility. Even though it was STAT, um, they're not covering that cost anymore. So they had to pay a $40 extra copay. So you really need to get to know your insurance plan. And it comes down to sometimes that you need to call your HR and find out what the plan is. Is there a case manager assigned to you? 
This helps with the Tarsiva case that I spoke about earlier. She try, they tried to really help expedite getting her coverage for the Tarsiva. It didn't work, but I had somebody that I could talk to, someone that family could talk to. We were all on the same page, and we tried to get her coverage. Uh, some insurances don't have that. Most people are going towards either a case manager, an oncology nurse manager. There's many different names within the insurance companies. Find out your drug benefits. As I said a few minutes ago, the prescription benefits is most important. Medicare, try to get a supplemental. I know it's extra money out, but in the end, it's going to help you pay for that cost. I mean, Timidar is so expensive. And Al and I, um, Ms. Ella, were talking about Avastin coverage. And I haven't really heard back about people getting paid out of pocket expenses for Avastin. Avastin's about $17,000 per dose. So that cost is usually covered if we have an authorization tag to it. This, the next thing I'm going to talk about is FDA approval. As long as it's FDA approved, so if you have a diagnosed GBM, it's approved for that on recurrent, so Avastin would be covered. And we have not had a problem with Avastin, but other people do. Timidar, on the other hand, we is across the neuro-oncology field, Timidar is used um, up front for many different diagnoses. Timidar is only covered for GBM and recurrent anaplastic astrocytomas. So if you fall into any of the other categories, it's not being covered because it's not FDA approved for it. So some of your insurance coverage will have a little clause at the end, does not cover FDA, non-FDA approved drugs. And that's what happened in the uh, Tarsiva case. And we see that a lot because insurance plans have become smarter. They used to go under, there's one diagnosis for a malignant brain tumor, it's 191.9. So now insurances are sending us forms and says, okay, your 191.9 is what? Is it a AA? Is it an oligodendroglioma? And we have to categorize it and subcategorize it. So they're becoming a little bit more savvy in how they're looking at the tumor because then they come back to us and say, we can't pay for it. And we did have somebody else who was on it for five years. She was on it for five years, right? She was on the drug for five years and reoccurred, and we put her back on Timidar, and they wouldn't pay because it was a different insurance company. So we had to get documentation from the company looking at trials that have been out there, and eventually we did get her the coverage that she needed. But it was a lot of legwork, and I'm very lucky to have Dr. Landolfi because he will get on the phone. He will yell at the doctors. He, get, you know, he, he uh, is a help to our cause to get you the care that you need. Um, Mail-away pharmacies, a lot of people don't know this when they're coming in. You go to your local pharmacy for short-term drugs, antibiotics, but for anything that's long-term or more chronic, mail-aways are becoming more acceptable and more reasonably cost for you. So Timidar actually is a drug that comes from Caremark, Acredo, mail-away pharmacies, Livestrong I think is another pharmacy, that are, are taking under the um, coverage of Timidar and it's not coming through local pharmacies. So that puts a damper in getting you to your cycle on time because we have to then go through the mail away company, make sure that they can drop ship it so that we can get it to you in a timely fashion and that the, the initial process usually takes about seven to ten days because they have to get you um, into the plan, into the network, check your benefits, and then call you. They won't discuss payment with me and tell you that your copayment is $500 or $5,000, and then you come back to me and say, I can't afford this medication. So it's becoming a longer and longer process, not for everybody, but for a, a large majority of the population that we're dealing with. Insurance denials, um, appeal, appeal, and appeal. There's usually three appeals. The first appeal, we do it by paper. Second appeal, it's doctor to doctor. And if it doesn't come, there is a third appeal. It costs you $25 to do the third appeal, and it actually goes to the healthcare appeals program, and they go to the New Jersey Department of Bank and Insurance. That's for New Jersey. I don't know the other states and how it works. And that's, this is going now on months, because we've gone to a first appeal, which takes a couple weeks, a second appeal, which takes a, you know, a, another week, and then you have to send it away. They have to evaluate it. So now we're talking months, and a lot of people can't afford that time. But it does take a lot of appeals, and I had a, a little divot there for those who heard my lecture before that said, bug your doctor, 
and your nurse, your physician's assistant, whoever's in that place, and my office mate last, so I took it out. But I'm telling you, it, I'm dealing with many, many patients. I have a vo voicemail system. I'm in with patients. You need to call me and bug me because that's going to remind me that we got to get this authorization through. And then I don't care if you call me three times and say, did you hear anything? Because then I'll refer it to Diane Minucci, who's Dr. Landolfi's and I, right and left hand, who's the secretary, and she can help me follow up with some of the insurance appeals. Um, if it is an appeal, you want to call the insurance company and ask them, do they have a specialty doctor, a neuro-oncologist? I want to speak to a neuro-oncologist. My neuro-oncologist wants to speak to your neuro-oncologist. Try to get them because they're going to be on the same page with treatment. So when we were trying to get the Tarceva, there was a general practitioner, there was a medical oncolog an oncologist, but there was no one that really understood the care of that brain tumor patient. Uh, in, and before you can apply for patient, patient assistance with any program, you need to have the appeal process started, even before the denial, but they want to know that you started it, they want to see the documentation. So make sure that once you know you're denied, that that paperwork is started right away. And you want to make sure that the diagnosis is written correctly because, you know, and, and that your doctor's documented. Like if you know that you had an AA or, or you're diagnosed maybe with an oligo, that it's gone to an anaplastic oligo, or that it's insinuating that it's an anaplastic. There's got to be some type of um, progression, some type of documentation that that tumor is a more malignant tumor because that's going to help in the appeals process. Um, and make sure anytime you go to the ER, a lot of people think that when you're in the emergency room that they're calling your doctor at home. And this just happened with my dad. And uh, he said, well, they're talking to Dr. Tom. And I said, no, they're not talking to Dr. Tom. They're not going to call Dr. Tom unless there's a reason for it or you're requesting it. So just because you had a seizure in the emergency room and they changed your medication, you know, they might have talked to one of the doctor's assistants on the phone, a resident on the phone. There must have been a third party in there. Make sure when you go to that doctor's office or call the next day and speak to the, whoever represents that doctor and say, this is the medication I'm on, this is what happened. Make sure it's reflected in the doctor's notes because when they look at our chart, they're going to look at everything that is written and, and look at the doctor's notes and the, what meds you've been on, what reactions you've had on them, and we need to document that so that we can give that information to them. Any side effects that you had, uh, and again, this is very important for fighting the authorization. Medication assistance programs. Most of the companies do have assistance program. Avast and Genentech's been great. They do Tarceva and, um, and Avastin. There's um, many copay, you know, there's loads of copay relief programs. The one problem that I'm finding with some of them is that if it's halfway through the month, their monies are already gone. So that you need to apply at the first of the month and you need to stay on top of it. Uh, drug companies have the assistance programs. They also have voucher cards. And voucher cards, I've never had to use it before, but I just used one for my child for um, pulmonary problems. And I was amazed. I paid $200 last time, and I told the doctor, which I didn't tell her last time, and she said, why'd you pay $200? She gave me this card, and I paid $5. So I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I guess, it, you know, here I'm, I'm practicing, not practicing what I preach. But it, it, made a di it made a huge difference. Not all companies, a lot of the seizure companies, because there's a lot of generics coming out now, and once a generic comes out, we can't get samples anymore. Uh, you know, the, they start to change their assistant programs, so they are giving out voucher cards. Uh, Zofran used to have an assistant program, and they don't have it anymore. So if we need Zofran, it's generic, but the generic, from what I stand, understand, could be still high on some coinsurances. So we really have to look at trying to get assistance from other avenues. Some local pharmacy have programs. You pay $35 a month, and they'll give you a supply of, like, a Zofran generic medication, so you can check into your local pharmacies. And some of the national brain tumor programs are trying to develop more patient care assistant programs. Um, we just did a fundraiser, uh, Flo's Chili Cook-Off, and all the proceeds from um, Flo's Chili Cook-Off will be coming to us on a yearly basis to try to help people with patient care and patient program assistant programs. So we're trying to see if where we can get funding and money um, to pay for some of the stuff that you guys need. And again, some of the resources, I know it's small in your, your book, um, and I know Nancy Conlevin uh, had given me another name, and I thought I wrote it down, but I don't have it. But um, Merck Helps is great. 
Um, again, I, I'm just recently running into if you do have a copay or if you're max out financially, they're not going to help you out and they're going to refer you to other copay assistant programs. Uh, Genentech has always been very good, but again, we have to, even if you're not FDA approved, so that person who um, had the Tarceba, they didn't pay not because she wasn't, it's not an FDA approved diagnosis, they didn't pay, sorry, <laughs> um, how do I go back? They didn't pay because she was a not con she was a, still a dependent of her parents even though she was older, and so we had a, we have to work with that so that we can help her get that, that payment for the Tarceva. Mm -hmm. When I was doing this talk, I spoke with uh, one of the managed care, uh, one of the uh, nurses that does pay, you know works with patients on the floor, case managers, and said. Tell me what I should tell a patient. If a patient's an inpatient, she said, if you're an inpatient you re and you're leaving to go home, request everything possible. Request that bedside commode, request any kind of assistance devices for the house, and ask them, you know, they, they are evaluating your physical therapist when they're in with you. Say, what do I need? If, am I going to need any assistive devices at home? Request it while you're in the hospital because it's easier to get paid for than when you go out of the hospital and have to pay for it on your own. A lot of times they won't cover it. In acute rehabilitation, if you're in the acute phase, a lot of times because they have um, one set of monies for the, the rehab stay, they're not going to let you start your radiation and your chemotherapy while you're in acute rehab. So if you're going to be there for an extended period of time, we have to try to work on ways to get you to get your rehab, uh, your radiation and also to get you your Timidar. And I ran into one insurance company that would not pay for the Timidar because you were still in acute rehab. So they would only pay for it once you were discharged. So we do have a lot of problems ahead of us to face, but we have to find creative ways to, to get, you, get you your medication. If you're homebound, your doctor can uh, write to uh, put a prescription in for LabCorp and Quest to have them come draw blood. Home health care nursing will not draw bloods for you at home. Um, so we have to call in other people. So LabCorp and Quest, if your insurance allows it, I have, it takes 48 hours to get it into, your, into the system so that you can get home blood draws, and we can do that on a weekly basis. Brain tumors and disability. We had wanted to get somebody to talk about disability, and I am not an expert in disability, but I will try to explain some of the disability issues. Um, docu documentation needs to be detailed, and we talked about this last night at the support group. Let your doctor know how you're feeling because so many of us want to feel good when you're coming into the office. So you might say, I feel great. But meanwhile, all the past weeks before you saw that doctor, all these little things were happening. Try to remember. Um, Tanya does a diary. Sorry, Tanya. <laughs> she does a diary so that she, through the time from one doctor visit to the next, she can go to the doctor and show them some of the symptoms that she's having so they have a clear picture of what's going on with her. And this way we can, they can scan it into their system, we can put it into our notes so that the doctor knows so that when they disability asks for our reports, it's in there that you are having problems because just the diagnosis of a brain tumor is not going to get you disability. So you want to, and when you hand in the paperwork, usually offices have three days to fill it out, but make sure that it gets filled out because it can get pushed in the wayside. You know, make sure that they know they have the paperwork and call to follow up to make sure that that disability paperwork um, is getting done. So you ha must be on disability for two years before Medicare, to be a Medicare eligible. However, a couple years ago, people here, um, Debbie Prasad was one of them that was at Capitol Hill fighting for people who are diagnosed with a GBM that they don't have that two years to wait for Medicare and they need to have it faster. So saying that, we are now part of the Compassion Allowance Conditions. There are actually, I believe, are 88 now, but there's 25 when I was first doing this and I looked last night and they did say 88 and they knew that they were working on more diseases. 25 rare diseases and 25 cancers that will allow you to be fast-tracked under cash, Compassionate Care Allowance, uh, Compassion Allowance Conditions to get disability faster. Grade three and grade four astrocytomas are included. But again, if you have an anopastic oligo and are having deficits and cannot work, that documentation from the doctor's office is gonna help us get you disability. So when you're applying for your disability benefits, you submit the initial application, you wanna make sure all your, doc all your documentation is order, in order. 
your notes from surgery, anything from physical therapy that would help, your doctor's notes that will help. Um, you want to make sure the application is filled out correctly. They will go through. If something's not answered or you're just not sure of it, make sure you get that answered before you submit that application because they can push that back then to the wayside. The process can take three to five months. If it's accepted, you will be awarded monthly, and they will pay you back pay from the time of your diagnosis. However, that's in a perfect world. 60% of claims are denied at the initial stage. And then once they go back for reconsideration, 85% are denied. So they are expecting that a majority of this population is just going to go and say, I'm not going to, you know, I was denied. And they don't fight for it. So turn around and you're going to fight for it. It's going to take longer, but you have 60 days to appeal. So in that, when you get that letter, you're going to appeal it. You want, and then if they deny it again, you want to request a hearing before the administrative um, law judge, and you want to present your case there. Um, you, they can offer you a free advocate or an advocate for disability. There's many Social Security attorneys. From the group that I, we had last night, I recommend getting an attorney because everybody, it's not an easy process. I think one person had an easy process in the group, and there was maybe 35 people there last night. Uh, the appeals process goes through a reconsideration stage, and they, then when that happens, they resubmit it to a third party. They don't review it. Whoever re initially reviewed it, a third party will review it and make a determination. If that's denied, then you go to the hearing stage. So the first stage is the administrative law judge. They're going to review it. They're either going to kick it back and say no, then they send it to the Social Security, then you can appeal it at the Social Security Appeals Council, which then either kicks it back to the law judge or makes the decision and sends it to you in the mail. If it's denied again at that point, then the federal district court becomes involved. Oh, that's my uh, next slide. So basically, it's making sure that the documentation is in order. Any condition that you're having, any problems that you're having, visual problems, you know, that you make sure that you talk to it about your doctor, that it does get into the doctor's note. Uh, you want to make sure that the applications are ahead of time. To research getting a disability attorney, to talk to other people, you know, our support group had a lot of information last night. I said some of them could come up and give you a better talk on disability than I can give you. Um, just because they're dealing with the process. And it's not one simple time. It comes back every year. You have to be um, re-looked at for your process of disability. One question uh, Dr. Landolfi and I get a lot is, uh, is medical marijuana. Uh, medical marijuana is something that is new to New Jersey. Um, it must be provided from a physician. You cannot grow your own. Um, you must have a terminal illness be determined less than 12 months. There's a lot of other um, stipulations. You, have, you can have uh, chronic nausea, um, but it's very defined as to who is going to get medical marijuana. Uh, people with ALS are considered, people with MS are considered, chronic pain considered. But again, it's, it's how the physician defines it and if they will accept you into the program. The physician has to do the initial um, applying for the drug for you, and then you have to apply online. It's a two-year, $200 application fee. They do have compassionate for people who can't pay the $200, but it's just not that easy uh, to get medical marijuana. And they only give you two ounces for 30 days. <laughs> Some additional resources um, I always give out. Uh, other assistance, I mean, I try to sit and give patients information. Um, ABTA, brain tumors, virtual trials, Al is here. He's one of my favorite sites. And, of course, NJBTA, you can find our information as well as the Monmouth information on that. And we try to update uh, with uh, different um, topics of what's going on in our group. And lastly, um, I ran... Well, Rand walked. I didn't run in that much. But uh, the 13.1 Long Branch, it was my first marathon. And I did it for Central New Jersey Support Group. And Debbie Prasad, who is now, uh, she dated someone that passed away from a GBM. And she's now a cancer survivor herself. And she just ran a marathon. But um, it was probably the most emotional run walk I ever had. I ran with Stan's daughter and Debbie. And we laughed, we cried, and, we, and everybody was there together to help to find a cure. 
And I'm John. <laughs> Up, someone's bringing up the microphone. Hi, I I want to ask you a question about disability. Uh, in one slide, you said diagnosis. If you are diagnosed with a GBM, but you do well, you do have you do not have other symptoms. Are you eligible for? You are eligible. Disability? And on paper, when I was reading about disability, uh, it looks like you'd be fast-tracked in. However, just because of the diagnosis, we've had patients that uh, are having a lot of problems with disability. So one person, I don't know if Megan and Victor are here, and I'm going to point them out. They, Victor, if you don't mind, he has a diagnosis of a GBM. And he had disability, and they are now retracting it and in a process with an attorney trying to get the benefits that he was paid for. So he was on it and had difficulty. So yes, you are compassionate, but it depends on who's that person that's reading the application, did you fill out everything. So even though you're fast-tracked, they're still going to scrutinize the application. And that's really what I've been hearing from patients who are having issues with disability. But apply immediately. I mean, I, I think that you should and you have to fight for it. And some people don't have the same problems. But you are eligible, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we filled out paperwork. Uh, we got our disability, and I had put in for Social Security, and he is on Social Security, and we didn't wait. We just went boom, boom. Right, and, and that's how it should work. I yeah. six months of disability, but he has great right through. into Social Security. That's and great, and, and that's how it should work, yeah. Because I hear a lot of horror stories, and I think we're blessed with that. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, and everybody safe driving home. I know, but I'm not going to be speaking to them again. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. And I think everything she said is something a lot of us can relate to. Um, when Ryan was on Kepra, his insurance just a year ago decided that they were going to not cover it anymore and only cover generic. Well, his doctor did not want him to go on generic because many of his patients were having seizures from it. So. They found, he was like Dr. Landolfi and Patty, they would fight with the insurance companies. Well, they found a way around it, and they gave Ryan Kepra XR, the time-released one. You find that, too. With, so it worked out. But we were scared because his seizures, he had the grand mal seizures. And he luckily has not had one since 2007, but very traumatic for me. Like I said, like I'm still paranoid. If he makes a noise, every two seconds, I'm like, are you okay? Are you all right? In the middle of the night, if he makes a noise or kicks, I'm like, are you okay? I wake him up to ask him, so. Sorry, I'm sure there's caregivers out there that can relate to that, though. 